You're listening to Death of the Reader. This is Flex and Herds here on your Murder Mystery World Tour. And Herds, we are returning to familiar territory today. <gasps> Simon Brett. The world famous Simon Brett, who yes. we've had on award winning show Death of the Reader That's right. last year. Former president of the Detection Club, founded by Agatha Christie and co. in the 1930s. Simon mm. Brett, A Decent Interval, was one of the first novels that I read while getting into actually solving murder mystery yeah. fiction. Legend says that this is the first novel that you employed your patented technique on, which we we might unveil through the course of this show. Indeed we which will. terrifies me, Flex. I'm, Herds, I'm terrified. It is a pleasure to be revisiting this novel, <laughs> but I've got to say, mm. two and a bit years down the line mm. from when I first finished this novel, it might be more actually, I didn't really date it, but... It's like reading a different novel coming back to this. Really? It's really weird. I don't know what changed for me personally in reading this novel, but I felt, I guess, a lot more uncomfortable reading it this time through. Mm. How so? First of all, before we get in, we should say we are covering chapters 1 to 11 on the show today. Yes. And that means we have gotten up to just after the murder has happened and our detective Charles Paris has been interrogated by the police. Which is an interesting turn of circumstance for the detective to be the yes. one being detectived. Um, I will say also, I wasn't sure if I was going to get a murder this time around, or, or a body, I should say. Uh, when uh, Mr. Jared Root ended up with his right side of his body crushed mm. by furniture, yeah. by the scenery, by the, by a giant skull collapsing on him, apparently. Uh, <laughs> my, my initial plan for this novel was to break it up so you saw Jared Root getting crushed. We'd end it there, and then you'd see the actual murder in part two. But the book was differently paced to how I right, remember right. it. Well, that's all right. I, I'll be honest, I've been focusing much more on the actual murder, so mm. it's a good thing you were like, oh, you should, you should solve... Who, who crushed Jared Root? Because I, w- I would not have had uh, nearly as clear of a picture of such things. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to solving this one. I, I think some things some things are jumping out at me pretty pretty quickly on this one. So I'm looking forward to getting to part three and getting to, to talk about that. But uh, you say you've been, you've been having some problems. It's a little bit foreign to you, this novel. It doesn't feel the yeah. same after, you know, two and a half years of experience with others. Yeah, I think the main thing that stood out to me is that the first time through this novel, I kind of read it through and I'd assumed that all of the things that Charles Paris said were meant to be character flaws. Mm. Like there's <laughs> many scenes of him drinking, of him objectifying women, about him complaining about feminism, yes. him complaining about Facebook and Twitter and all of those I things. I mean, the very first scene that we have with him is he sa- him saying, I was watching this program with a feminist on it and all he could do was look at her with, with her breasts. And I wasn't sure whether that was offensive, but it probably was. Like he is... He is clearly meant to be sympathetic, but he is so out of touch. I know. It is blinding. And the thing that, you know, the first time through, I assumed that these were all character flaws. And I was like, oh, you know, this is this is all, you know, obviously very, uh, you know, very indicative of who Charles Paris is and Mm. out of touch old man out of the world. Yep. Yep. But reading it through the second time, I was getting a little concerned because it started to feel to me like, well, if we were meant to highlight that he was out of touch, why are we actually spending all of this time on these descriptions? Why are we constantly throwing mm. back to the same jokes? It felt like it thought it was being funnier than it was, and I was maybe. concerned that maybe the book was actually coming from the opposite perspective, that it is the world who is out of touch. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll let you know that I uh, actually listened to the audiobook for this one. Yeah. I, have n- I have not touched the actual physical novel, so heresy, I know. Heresy. But, but I, I've really enjoyed listening to Simon Brett, actually, through, I believe it's Isis Audio Productions. Yeah. It's the company that, that produced it, but he reads his own novel, and the way that he delivers those lines, um, particularly when he's talking about sexual encounters and all that sort of thing. Sexual, I believe he pronounces it. Like, he is hamming it up. I have no doubt in my own mind uh, that he is intending this as a a joke, as a bit of a jab at at Charles Paris himself. It definitely can be a bit grating, and I I still hold (laughs) to my original opinion that I think that it is meant to be all his character flaws because the book is Mm. far too self-aware of Mm. all of the things he is unaware of. Sure. But yeah, I think that Charles Paris is a very interesting character because he is one of a generation of detectives who are Mm. built on their flaws, particularly that post kind of noir crime era where we get away from the eccentricities elevating the character as we do with Hercule Poirot. Mm -hmm. We get away from the manly madness of Roderick Allen in Naya Marsh. Mm. Uh, We get away from Father Brown who 
Nah. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. Um, and we get into this realm of detectives in the modern day who have just outstanding character flaws. I yep. think that if you look at the way that these flaws are written into the novel, there's a lot of commitment to it, which is why I think I found it uncomfortable going back to it again. Yeah. But it's that same level of commitment that I think makes me understand why someone as multifaceted and talented as Bill Nye was cast to play him in various dramas and adaptations oh, of this. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's a character that is in such depth, uh, even with such a, you know, short portrayal, that you can really see how someone like Bill Nye would be able to actually, you know, flex those acting chops mm. in that role. No, and sure. I'd really love to, at some point on the show, maybe actually sit down and look at one of those adaptations. I'd love to. Maybe we do that after we uh, after we finish this up. I know that yeah, there is an adaptation of this uh, of this novel here, a, a decent. Interval. Are you about to take more points away from me by what? not letting me solve another book, Herds? I mean, I was planning on it, but when you put it that way, maybe that's too obvious. Maybe I need to find a more surreptitious way. That's of right. You're points. still in the lead. I have ground to gain. It's true. I am. Look, I'm winning for once. I'll take it. No, no, for sure. No, I, I definitely agree with you. I think that the um. The consistent the consistency with which uh, Charles Paris's uh, flaws are brought up, it's clearly going to tie into the rest of the novel. I think it's also probably going to tie into the the actual solving of the case, which I'm mm. looking forward to. Um, and I really enjoy. I want to give a shout out uh, his lovely wife Fra Frances. Yes, uh, who just the most up tolerant individual semi ever. <laughs> Well, she's constantly throwing him around. Like, she's constantly putting his back to the wall saying, well, that's not really what you meant. And, like, who are, who are you Who are you involved with? Why? Like, we haven't spoken in, in so long. Like, she's just constantly putting him up against the wall and putting out his flaws. And I really appreciated that. Yeah. Um, I, I'm kind of loving this because, as you point out, almost all of the detectives that we've had on the show, even – uh, even I would say uh, the uh, the Knives Out, which we you know really enjoyed mm. last year. Uh, all the detectives are nearly flawless in their depiction, mm. um, and so getting to actually do a proper study on a detective as out of touch as you know away from not just the world but also the uh, the process of solving the murder case. Mm. He's he's openly being interrogated. He is the primary suspect of the murder. Yeah. Um, and not to the point where it's, you know, turned into a crime novel. He's being chased around by police cars quite, but he's clearly being, uh, being portrayed in a very vulnerable state, which I really appreciate in a protagonist. I like to, uh, I like to write and I like to read a lot of protagonists that have a vulnerability to them so mm -hmm. that we can really see, you know, them push past that. Um, and indeed, uh, Charles Paris is trying to better himself, uh, even if he fails miserably by having a, the old bells every single night. Yeah. I think one of the other things that is excellent about the portrayal of Paris in this novel is the way that it reframes the standard device of the amateur detective the amateur detective versus the police. <laughs> yeah. Because obviously, I think particularly with Sherlock Holmes, that's kind of a big part of the narrative is that the amateur detective is kind of working under the noses of, but still against the police. Mm -hmm. And this just takes it to the next level yep. of, you know, as you say, the detective just outright being suspected by the yes. police. I um I, I found it really interesting because this is another, yet another murder mystery set in a theater, which I love, by the way. But the fact that we've chosen Hamlet specifically and portrayed uh, Charles as the ghost of all the characters, because if, if you're not familiar with Hamlet, which, you know, you should, you should be familiar with the story um, if you've ever been through a, a high school, you know, English class. But uh, the, the character of uh, Hamlet's, Hamlet's father's ghost, uh, beseeches Hamlet to pursue his own killer. Um, that's that's kind of the ghost role in the story. It's the call to action in the hero's journey, all that sort of thing, mm. which is interesting in that uh, with uh, the death of uh, of, of Miss, Miss Katrina, which yes. we'll, we'll get to later, uh, Charles is both working as the ghost seeking to uh, you know, figure out who the who the killer is as a detective, um, but is also acting in the role of of Hamlet, which I found to be particularly interesting. Mm. Um, it almost makes me wonder if the if the police are going to turn to the role of Fortinbras, 
um, which again, if you're not familiar with, they're they're foils to each other, Hamlet and Thornton Blythe. Yeah. Whereas Hamlet, uh, his father is killed, and so he seeks most doggedly to find who who has killed them, what mm. has happened, and like seek the truth. Thornton Brass raises an army and goes off to capture a hill that doesn't matter to anybody. So I wonder if by the end of this novel, we're going to have the police, you know, come in with some, you know, uh, entirely inconsequential, you know, solving of the case. Yeah. Or worse, to to take the credit of 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 Hamlet uh, of. Uh, of Charles at the end, mm. which is I, very interesting. Yeah, no, that definitely is a fun possibility. And I think the other thing that's very interesting is having spoken with Simon Brett last year, he was saying that a lot of his writings reflect his interest in the arts and media. And I think that that's very apparent in the writing here. It tackles it in a very upfront way with a lot of modern references that you wouldn't see out of a lot of other writers. You know, even when we look at Dame Nio Marsh, when we look at Agatha Christie, they were people who were elevated in society for their contributions and revival of their respective theater scenes. Mm. But Simon Brett tackles it in a way that is much more upfront and highlighting the problems of the theater in a, you know, not a way that was exclusive from how the others were doing it but i think that it's very present and i like the way that it actually deals with the issues so just in your face yeah i really appreciate how critical he is of a career in acting in mm. particular which is something that i've been cautioning and time time and time again you know if you go for career in acting you should have a fallback because you know, your chances are one in a million and those one in a million chances are so huge. You become a celebrity and you have this whole like reality television show based around your life or whatever on, you know, Star Hunt or yeah, Top yeah. Pop, which are names that are just real enough that I can hate them. Um, <laughs> like there's no other way to put it, Excellent honestly. Way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the way that he he kind of critiques the, the clash between uh, theater, uh, modern theater and television shows, mm. how they're two very different types of mediums, um, and particularly the the managers of the of the, the talent that they're having in the in the play, um, that being Jared Root and uh, and Katrina, yes, I last name, but uh, the two of those being brought on to to elevate the show yeah. without having any actual acting talent, even if they might be excellent personalities, they like they have the egos to match, you know, those reality TV shows where you need those big personalities to push performances of those shows. And yeah, yeah. so that when the editing crew gets in and, you know, they can work their magic, they have a lot to work with. Um, but obviously for a theater space, it's not really what you're looking for. It's mm. only going to cause problems. Yeah. And I think that particularly the way that, we look at the engagement between the social media and reality TV side mm. of things. There's, I wouldn't necessarily say a level of understanding in how Simon Brett approaches it, but I think a great level of awareness in how a lot of it is very fleeting and the book yeah. kind of tries to highlight that. It's almost a side metaphor for the standard thing about death. You know, life is fleeting and we should capture <laughs> every moment and we're yeah. juxtaposing it with this social media narrative, which I think is very standard for modern novels, but I like the execution a lot yeah. here. I will say I like the excuse that Simon Brett is, is cleverly using by having this old fart detective mm. in that he can still address social media without having to get into the nitty gritty of it. Mm. Like it's, in my, from my perspective, a very good excuse for for Simon Brett as a writer to not have to show an intimate understanding of all of the social media trends that have ever existed, because you know social media, Twitter, and Facebook are such ever evolving platforms in that regard. Yeah, um, I think it really helps him to focus on the people and the places and say, yes, social media exists. Yes, it's important, but we don't need to you know dig through Katrina's Twitter history and see who she's following. Yeah. Like it, we just need to know that she has, you know, thousands of followers compared to Jared's millions. That's all that we need to know. Yeah. It's right? actually kind of quite curious now that you mention it. I don't think I've ever read a crime fiction novel that just dealt with social media up front. I'm sure yeah. that they're out there and I just haven't read them. But, you know, the only one that I can think of is uh, the BBC Sherlock series. Right, right. And even then, it's just like he's flicking images of social media Trying away Trying to in find front the important him. thing, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I'd be very interested to see how younger writers, as they start to come through, will start reinterpreting what it means to have digital media and connectivity yeah. in uh, a genre that is so typically closed off. Yeah. I, I have not had the pleasure of reading a murder mystery that tackles social media particularly well. 
Um, there was an episode of Black Mirror that I don't know was brilliant, but it involved, uh, a, you know, one of the characters was committing a crime. Mm. And so the police were trying to figure out, you know, who is this guy? Why are they kidnapped for these employees of this big social media company? What's going on? Um, and then the people who were working at the social media company came into the police's headquarters and said, well, we've looked through his tweets and we figured out exactly who he is and what he wants. Yeah. Um, and then they use that information to try to coach their CEO mm. to talk to the guy and try and get him to step back from his, the criminal, like the criminal act that he's currently yeah. undertaking and like let the hostage go. Mm. It's, um, it's, it's really clever. Yeah. And I mean, obviously we have plots about precognition in crime and that's kind of very popular and it'll again be interesting to see how those are reinterpreted given the modern level of engagement with social media anyhow you are listening to death of the reader we are flex and herds discussing a decent interval by simon brett chapters 1 to 11 here on death of the reader we will be back in just a second You're listening to Death of the Reader. This is Flex and Herds bringing you a decent interval by Simon Brett here on your Murder Mystery World Tour on 2SER. And Herds, mm. I have a deliberation for you to make. Oh, do you? Oh, I'm scared. This is not what I was expecting. We have agreed that this year on Death of the Reader is double or nothing. Yes. Every book is worth two points. Mm. And at the end of the year, whoever has the lowest goes to zero. Yes. I'm in. Now, is that Herds. A deliberation? <laughs> The yeah. deliberation I have for you to make okay. is you get to pick where your two points come from. Okay. If you think you can solve this novel this week, you can have one point for oh. trying to solve it this week and one point for trying to solve it the next. Or okay. Okay. you can take a reprieve if you can solve the method and the culprit of both the crushing and the killing, you can have your two points. Uh, I'll be honest. I don't know that I can solve the method of the crushing. I have not. I am not prepared for that. So I suppose I'll take trying to solve uh, the the proper murder or the manslaughter, as it may be. All right. But yeah. So I'm looking forward to hearing your solution on the show this week, then. All right. Because the it. stakes have just been raised. All right. I'm into it. Now, Herds, I think the first thing we should go over is the separation between the, the two crimes, one of which we don't even really know is a crime, as mm -hmm. you say. Mm -hmm. There is the crushing of Jared Root, mm -hmm. immobilizing him, taking him out of the starring role, and the murder of Katrina. Mm -hmm. Manslaughter. Yes. <clears throat> maybe. Uh, mm, I, mm, well, maybe. We'll see. That's, that's, that's something I'm working on. Jared Root is found after a loud crash is heard on the stage and people rush to find him crushed underneath a large skull, which Charles Paris notices is fortunately just light enough to have not killed the man. Yes. Only dis dislocating his collarbone, I believe. I mean, we literally have a discussion uh, in, in a bar, uh, you know, some, some mysterious voice saying, oh yeah, I totally did the deed. But if you don't pay me, then there'll be more deeds to come. Mm -hmm. And he, he bat, bats his evil eyelashes That's at the right. camera just off screen so he can't tell who it is. Um, I think it's pretty clear. I think it's pretty clear to say that uh, Jared's uh, crushing was a deliberate, uh, a deliberate design here by someone who wanted him out of the picture. Perhaps even done by some kind of professional. Or, or it could be said that it was a opportunistic taking of credit to try and get Maybe. some additional leverage behind the scenes. Maybe. I wouldn't discount that so easily. And then, of course, we have our murder where, during the decent interval, Charles Paris rushes in to the main actor's dressing room to find her strewn across the ground, dead. Yes, Katrina. Cold in blood. Katrina of Star Hunt fame yes. uh, is found with blood everywhere, and it looks like she's been rubbing at her eye, mm -hmm. which I find to be a very curious, uh, a very curious detail. Um, I'm going to let you know, I'm working with two concurrent theories right now. Excellent. Which is the fun part of, of this show, because I will tell you the very first thing that I thought when he walked into the star dressing room, because up until this point, I thought, all right, so clearly uh, Jared was attempted to be taken out of the picture and that didn't work. Mm -hmm. Um, and clearly what's his face? Will was very excited to get the new part. Um, maybe there's something going on there. Who knows? Uh, but clearly, uh, somebody wanted Jared, you know, out of the picture. And now Sam has been, has been brought in to play the role yes. of Hamlet. 
uh, and seems to and seems to be given much more credit than one would normally assume for the role. Yes, yes. Uh, this is this is where my brain is is torn between two possibilities here. Excellent. Because we know that it was a last minute change that brought Katrina to the star dressing room, and it seems like she uh, officiated that all on her own. So the question that I have uh, is who. And this is this is why I'm a little bit scared. But who knew that she had actually changed dressing rooms? Um, because I think that that's going to play into our solution here. Uh, you think that she was offered the change of dressing rooms to get her in position for the murder? It doesn't sound like she was offered it. It sounded like she she had a hostile takeover. Uh, I believe the the analogy that they use is as of uh, Hitler annexing uh, some some particular country. And it sounds like it wasn't it wasn't offered. It sounds like it was a pretty spontaneous act, possibly while the play was going on. That's what it sounds like. Mm. Um, and so I'm torn between two possibilities here. Uh, either somebody who knew that Katrina was being moved uh, is is responsible, which pretty well puts anybody acting in the play out of the picture because they mm-hmm. would have been on stage uh, or otherwise rehearsing their lines, preparing for the show. Uh, I definitely think the killer we're looking for is somewhere either in the stage crew or the production team, Mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Uh, The other option, of course, is that the person who has uh, arranged for this death is was not aware uh, was not aware that Katrina would be in there, and that's the part that I'm struggling with because there was blood on the floor, which implies that the murder happened in person, Mm -hmm. uh, but. Katrina was seen or was uh, presumably rubbing her eye shortly before uh, before the murder occurred, which seems like there's been some tampering with the makeup. It seems like what might have been going on there. She's like, oh, I've got like poison on my face. That's the part that curious, I'm struggling curious. with. Those, those are the two concurrent theories that I have. Um, and I think that the people who most directly benefit from either of the two star actors going under uh, for Katrina is obviously Millie. Um, and I will say, due to the rubbing at the eye and whatever seems to have gone on here, it implies that there's been a very kind of amateur approach mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. this kill. It seems like things either didn't go to plan or like the kill was particularly brutal. I don't know. It, I'm I'm not sure what's going on in that room there. I'm looking Herds. for clarification. Well, I, I think I think that you're you're on the right trail. The murder did indeed happen in the room. Sure. I'm just saying. I think that if the intended target was Katrina, mm-hmm. I think that it is most likely Millie who has who has done the deed. Uh huh. You don't um, at all suspect her manager, who would be the one at her beck and call, and likely no, would have I known think, exactly where she was. I think that she's far too directly related to the victim mm-hmm. to have done it. Um, I think that you feel like it would be a career suicide per se for her to be involved yes, with the murder. Uh-huh. I I definitely think so. I think that Millie makes a lot of sense. I've also noted that a lot of the thematic conflict in the novel is around generation differences. Yes. I think that our killer is more likely to be one of the younger actors in the performance. Really? uh, Which coincidentally also narrows our pool pretty substantially. I Um, would have maybe thought the other way around if it was meant to be about generational conflict, that the younger actress would have been taken out by one of the older members. None of the the actors, none of the older actors stand to, to gain. I will say though, Gertrude's actress Geraldine, is yes. Geraldine is raising some eyebrows. I think that she's a red herring, though. I don't really? think that she's the okay. killer. Because what is her motive? Well, here's the thing I want right. to post to you, Herds, is that you, you've kind of thrown earlier in the show this theory about how the novel might follow the whims of Hamlet, mm-hmm. the stage play that it is set around. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious if you think that the murder will be the same, or if maybe the murder will, for example, follow one of the other analogies, such as, you know, the annexation of countries by Hitler. Sure. If we can maybe expect to find out that the annexation ended in I suicide when the Russians came and knocked on the door. I don't think this of- is suicide somehow. Okay. I don't think so. Like... Poison in the eye is not a great way to commit mm-hmm. suicide. Let's put it that way. Also, why would Katrina do that? She's young and full of full of vigor. I think that it is much more likely that we're dealing with one of the younger actors because Geraldine, despite being constantly raising red flags, is not very present. Uh-huh. Uh, I think that it's the the trigger that I need to figure out going forward in the story is whether or not Katrina was the intended victim. Oh, uh, because if she was 
then it's I think it's got to be Millie. She's the person who stands the most to gain here. It also puts her in uh, on the same star level, even if she can't act as well as yes. her boyfriend Sam. Uh, I think she's a pretty obvious contender for killer. Um, on the other hand, and this is the thing, this is a character that jumped out at me almost immediately as like obviously the killer because of how passionate they are. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Will. I forget his last name, but Will is the understudy for Hamlet. And I think that Jared's crushing was deliberately arranged. I think that that is the case. You're telling me that the man that stands to gain the position of Hamlet by killing the man playing Hamlet would be the one to kill Hamlet? Uh, y yes. Okay. Is the thing. I don't think that, that Sam is behind... Oh, sorry, not Sam, rather. Sam Will. hadn't been introduced at the Will. time. Will. I don't think that Will was behind the crushing... I love that we're just calling it the crushing, but... I mean, what else I, are we going to I call it? I don't think that Will was behind the crushing of Jared earlier in the novel. Um, it sounds like there's money involved, and I don't think that Will has that kind of money. Mm -hmm. He seems like a scrappy kid. Uh, I think it's more likely that somebody else has arranged for this crushing and that he's, you know, seeing this opportunity to step in the limelight. And he mentioned that, like, he's super excited and he knows all the lines and he wants to get his father in. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't seem entirely there, honestly, mentally. Uh, I think that if it turns out that, you know, for example, that Millie didn't know that uh, that Sam had changed rooms. I think that he is a much more likely culprit. Um, and honestly, just by his behavior alone, by how excited he was and that extra kind of twinge of like, oh, my father's going to come and see the play. I think that he is a more likely culprit out of the two of them. I think that either he's tried to try to actually kill uh, Sam via this, uh, this, this poison of the eye, mm -hmm. um, or he's tried to sabotage them realize that uh he's got the wrong person tried to silence them by like beating their head in yep, yep we haven't had a proper kind of uh examination of the crime scene yet so i'm kind of waiting on that for the final verdict but honestly i think that especially since we haven't addressed the fact that the that katrina switched rooms so late in the kind of in the performance yeah i think that he's a much more likely culprit well, Herds, I, I'm curious as to whether you think this can stand as a final theory. You reckon that Will is the one responsible? Yes. For yes. both incidents? No, no, no. I Just think I'm, I'm not sure. This is why I didn't put points on Jared. Uh -huh. I could not tell you. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to figure out who has crushed Jared. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot that stood out to me as particular evidence, except that whoever is doing it has money. So Very it's likely either Ned English, who is the director and has been pretty flustered with him. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's probably the most likely culprit uh, because he's just been so completely, you know, yeah. fed up with him. I will say, I think one of the things that's confusing at this point in the book, because it doesn't really ever quite elaborate on it, is the reputation of the theater company that is putting on the show. Sure. Um, I think that it kind of is meant to have a poor reputation and, you know, doesn't pay very well, which is an interesting thing to lend to your theory there, the idea mm. that there are only so many characters who would actually have money to throw around behind the yes. scenes. The only characters who really could fit that bill are Ned English, mm -hmm. who's a maybe. The person with the most money is Tony, the uh, the producer of the show. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking for someone with means, he certainly fits the bill. But I don't know why he would want to crush his star actor when they're Indeed. like one of the two drivers of popularity of the show that seems like a pretty dumb unless move. of course unless of course he was trying to gain the publicity by crushing the more popular man you know what i'm in on that that sounds like a theory to me because i i don't know like i think that surely, Ned English is frustrated surely hurts you would want to get rid of your two worst actors while generating the most publicity about <laughs> their removal which is exactly what's happened here mm. personally i think that the people that stand the most to gain here is everyone except the people who died <laughs> I mean, that's not that's not unfair to say. That's the thing, though. I, I think that uh, you can spin, and this is something that I've learned. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll talk about more of this next week, but I mm -hmm. play a lot of mafia games, a lot of werewolf games. And one of the things that you can do as the informed, uh, you know, more powerful party who's trying to hide the truth uh, is that you could spin logic any which way you possibly mm -hmm. can. And I think you could spin any of the characters, except maybe Dennis, uh, <laughs> into being the killer. But I think that the the trick that stands out the most to me is the fact that the rooms were switched. And I think that the only character who really stands out to me, if uh, Sam was the intended target for the murder, is Will himself. So I'm going to put it on him. Um, I'm going to say that he's put some kind of poison in, in her makeup, which is, again, a classic of the theater genre. 
and that maybe he realized he'd got the wrong target, and so he just decided, well, might as well finish her off. In for a penny, in for a pound. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, yeah, and I think he's done it to try and get the role of Hamlet in, in Hamlet. All right. Well, yeah. Herds, thank you for locking in your theory. There it is. I'm excited to break it down next week, see what did and did not work out for you. Let's see how we go. The question I have before we leave today, Herds, is no points on the table. Mm. Do you think the shady man taking credit for the crushing of Jared Root was the one responsible? Yes. Yes. All right. I do think so. Fantastic. Well, Herds, next week we are going to be covering chapters 12 to 19 of A Decent Interval by Simon Brett. We will see you next week on Death of the Reader. We have Flex and Herds. Thank you very much for joining us. Have fun. We'll see you next time. 